Ladies and gentlemen, the 19th annual virtual beacon celebration will begin in 10 minutes.
Ladies and gentlemen, the 19th annual virtual beacon celebration will begin in five minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, it is almost that time. Our 19th annual virtual beacon celebration will begin in one minute.
Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Reggie Rivers, a host with the Virtual Gala team, and I'm excited to be here for the 19th annual Beacon Celebration, but this is the first time we're ever doing it virtually, and so we're going to have a lot of fun here in this first ever virtual gala to benefit Sewell Child Development Center. Now, social distancing might stop us from giving handshakes and hugs and pats on the back, but it's not gonna stop us from supporting Sewell Child Development and the children and families that they support and they need our help more than ever right now. Before we get too far down the road, we have one quick piece of technology advice. It can be difficult to watch the show and bid or donate if you're trying to do all of that on the same device. So we recommend that you watch the program on your laptop or desktop and you bid in the silent auction and make donations using your cell phone. Okay, I have two wonderful guests that I get to introduce here, and then we have some other special guests that are coming up later. Uh, first, we have Heidi Heisenbuttel. She is the president and CEO of Sewell Child Development. Heidi, how are you doing? I'm great. I'm so glad to be here with you tonight for the first ever virtual beacon, and we wish we could be with each of you individually, but this is the next best thing, and we thank you all for joining us and supporting Sewell tonight. I couldn't agree more, and it's so good to see you, Heidi. Thank you. We'll come back to you shortly. I also get to introduce uh, Steve Holloway. He's the chairman of the board and the parent of two former Sewell students. Steve, how are you doing? Doing well tonight, Reggie. Good. I want to say thank you to all of you who have joined us in this sort of unusual Beacon celebration. It's exciting to have you and an honor and a privilege to uh, celebrate tonight and support a great cause. All right, thank you very much, Steve. We're glad to have you here and we'll be back to you in just a few minutes. Okay, so let's take a look at our agenda for this program tonight. First, we're going to explain why we're doing this virtual gala. Second, we'll tell you how you can get signed up to participate and make contributions. Third, I'm going to interview Heidi and Steve to get a better understanding of what Sewell Child Development Center does and why it's so important to support them right now. We've also got a video and interview with board member Tyler Gomez, and so we look forward to that. Fourth, we'll conduct a paddle raiser so we can all get involved. Fifth, we have Dr. Temple Grandin. Uh, she's a professor up at Colorado State University. She is tonight's keynote speaker. She's going to share her insights and have a Q&A session. So please get think of questions that you might like to ask of Dr. Grandin, and you can put them in the the uh, comments in Facebook and we'll gather them from there and we'll ask a little bit later. And then finally, we will celebrate and wrap things up. Okay, there's something that each of you can do right now to help Sewell Child Development. It doesn't cost a penny, but it will make a big difference. I want each of you to please lean forward and click the share button on Facebook. So you're watching this program on Facebook and you have a network of friends and family. And if you share this to your network, then some of your friends and family are gonna discover a passion that you have, that the love that you have for Sewell Child Development, they might tune in, they might learn more about this organization, they might even make a donation to this organization uh, because they admire the work that Sewell does, but more likely just because they care about you. Their love for you might cause them to um, wanna participate with Sewell tonight. So please reach forward, click the share button on Facebook and share this to your network of friends and family. Next up, I wanna catch everyone up to speed on why we're here tonight. You know, the coronavirus has forced nonprofits all over the country to cancel, postpone, or otherwise abandon their plans for their annual gala. And so the staff and the board at Sewell had a big decision to make. They had to decide, should we postpone not knowing when the end of the coronavirus would come, or should we just cancel and not do this year's event at all? And ultimately, they concluded that they wanted the opportunity to connect with you about Sewell's mission and share the work that they're doing with children and families during COVID-19. So here we are in this virtual Beacon uh, Gala, and here all of you are joining us. So thank you so much for making Sewell Child Development a priority tonight. We appreciate you. All right, next on our agenda is make sure you know how to bid. Here is, are the instructions um, you can go to that URL, but the simple instructions are to text Sewell to 50155. If you have already registered, then just look in your uh, text messages on your phone for a message from the number 50155 and click that link. If you have not yet registered, please do so. It's really easy. Text the word Sewell to 50155 and then click the link that you get back after that. All right, so um, we have... I want to tell you about our sponsors right now. Give a shout out to our sponsors. Let's go back one slide, uh, please. Um, we have uh, 
We'll stay here. Actually, come out to me, please, uh, Selena. So we want to give a special shout out to our sponsors. And the coronavirus has dramatically shifted their roles, too, that they some of our sponsors have lost revenue. Some of them have had to lay off workers. Um, but despite their own troubles, they have not forgotten about Sewell Child Development. And we appreciate them for continuing their support at a time when it's needed most. Um, here's a reminder to all of you. If you need a service or product that one of our sponsors or in-kind donors offers, um, and you need it, make an order with them because they could use it. It helps them uh, pay their employees and it, it lets them know that during tough times, we've got their backs the same way that they've always had our backs. All right, so we've, we've got, uh, we're gonna tell you about some sponsors tonight and we're gonna applaud after each one of them. And I want you to join in on the applause. I actually have a little applause button here, but we're going to have some applause. And I think I'm just going to do a little, a little shoulder dance every time, every time we applaud for somebody. So you can join me in dancing with your shoulders. We're going to start off by thanking Marilyn Brown. She is a longtime Sewell partner and supporter. Marilyn believes in supporting teachers because when teachers are supported, they can be there to support children and families to the fullest. So thank you, Marilyn Brown. We want to say thank you to Cigna. Cigna is a generous guiding light sponsor. We're excited to have them on board with us. Thank you, Cigna. We want to say thank you to Tedstrom Wealth Advisor. Peter Tedstrom is a former board member, longtime Sewell partner and supporter, and he serves on the We Are All Better Together campaign committee. Thank you, Peter and Tedstrom Wealth Advisors. I want to say thank you to Lynn Stambaugh. Lynn is a patron sponsor and a Sewell board member. She serves on the program and event committees and has been crucial to the success of tonight's event. So thank you, Lynn Stambaugh. We want to say thank you to Midwest One Bank. This is a patron sponsor. Kevin Conroy is a senior VP of commercial banking. He's a board member and serves on the event committee. He's been crucial to the success of tonight's event. Thank you, Midwest one bank and Kevin Conroy. We want to say thank you to Casey and Ed Adams. They are patron sponsors. Casey serves on the event committee and has been essential to the success of Sewell's events. Thank you, Casey and Ed Adams. And I know you're all dancing with your shoulders at home. It's not just me. I want to say thank you to our patron sponsors, Heidi and Eric Anderson, Luce Daniels Weinberg and Peter Weinberg, Steve and Laura Holloway, and the Mental Health Center of Denver. Thank you. We want to say thank you to our partner sponsors, Randy and Elizabeth Sylvan, Ann uh, and Burton Wilson, um, Digitech Systems LLC, and Bill Holland and Brian Cave Layton Paisner LLP. Thank you. And thank you to all of our in-kind sponsors. Their generosity and support has enabled us to hold this silent auction. So thank you for their support and please enjoy the bidding tonight. All right, so now it is my pleasure to reintroduce to you all the way from, well, I think just from her office at Sewell Child Development, it is Heidi Heisenbuttle, President of <laughs> Thank you, Reggie. We yes. did not practice shoulder dancing in our dress rehearsal. I'm totally impressed. <laughs> That's a true story. Yep. Well, I know you were doing it, though. Sure I was. All right. And I want to bring out Steve Holloway from the middle of Denver. You know, if you took a map of Denver and you put a pin right in the middle of that map, it would have hit Steve's house. Welcome, Steve. Thanks, Reggie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, the two of you are going to give us some insights about Sewell Child Development. And, and Heidi, for those who are just learning about Sewell Child Development, can you give us a, a brief history and share the mission? Sure. Sewell has a 76-year-old history, and but in the last 31 years, we've been an integral part of the community in providing high-quality services inclusively to early childhood, um, focused on early childhood. We work with young children of all abilities, all socioeconomic statuses, race and ethnicities, and all children learn together in the same classrooms. 
So we've had a focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion for many years. Over those years, our services have expanded in depth from infant toddler home visits and diagnostic evaluation clinics and in breadth throughout the city and county of Denver. Sewell serves over 300 preschoolers in nine different locations, over 100 children with disabilities in 45 Head Start classrooms, and about 78 infant toddlers at home or in one of our four toddler rooms. And this year we opened up our first ever infant room. For those of you who haven't experienced our programs in action, we invite you to set up a virtual tour or better yet, an in-person tour when the pandemic is behind us. And in addition to what you hear tonight, you'll see the difference that Sewell makes when early childhood team members, such as early childhood educators, special educators, speech language pathologists, occupational physical therapists, mental health providers, partner with families to make a difference in young children's um, life. So thank you and thanks for being here. Yeah, well, that's that's wonderful. Thank you for that uh, that history and that and that wrap up. And Steve, um, Heidi mentioned diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I understand that's part of what drew you to Sewell. You know, that's exactly right. I think we live in a time where um, we're all aware of uh, the changes in society and, and in some respects how divided we are. And I'm attracted to organizations that really invest in kind of an alternative model, a model that brings people together. Um, Sewell has a 75-year history, 75 year history of bringing kids together and creating a high quality early childhood education environment that includes children of all abilities in the same context. Uh, I've been involved with Sewell one way or another for what, almost 30 years, long before I had kids. Uh, and I decided uh, as a volunteer that if I ever had kids in the future and I was still in the area that I might select Sewell uh, for their early childhood education. And I'm so glad that I did. Both of our kids are thriving uh, now, both in middle school. And one of the things that I think that they took away from that experience is the importance of uh, diversity and inclusion. I think that they are better people for having uh, attended Sewell. They're more compassionate, more thoughtful, and more understanding of diversity. And so I am proud to continue to support the organization because of its values. Oh, that is wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing that, Steve. We appreciate you. And um, Heidi, I want to go back to you. I know that 2020 has been a year like like none other. Um, and so how has this impacted Sewell? So starting in March, Sewell's preschool and child care services had to shut down much like the rest of Denver. But staff quickly adapted to remote services. We learned to have staff meetings on Zoom and circle times remotely. And we invested in ways to get the appropriate technology to staff and families. With the support of Karen and Jim Passell, we started the Emergency Family Relief Fund and we provided food and rent assistance to over 40 families throughout the spring and early summer. With additional support from the Passells, we also were able to train our staff while they were home um, working virtually and 45 different staff members participated in a Reggio inspired training module sponsored through the University of Colorado at Denver. Then in early June, as things became a little safer, we started opening our full day childcare rooms in phases. And by late August, most of our sites had a plan for reopening. Ultimately, we know that young children learn better through play and interaction, and we're trying to keep children engaged as much as possible. We make decisions every night based on the guidance from the public health department, and it's our goal to stay open as long as possible and, and keep interacting with children and families. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, Steve, you are the chairman of the board. Tell me, what do you think about the work that your event committee has done? So far, it's been excellent. I really admire their efforts uh, to make a important program to Sewell come off in a, in a most unusual way. Uh, Casey Adams, Kevin Conroy, and Lynn Sambaugh have just done an excellent job in uh, not allowing COVID or the challenges of our times and this year get in the way of an important event. So uh, with a great deal of gratitude, I, I appreciate their level of commitment to the organization and I know that tonight's program is really going to shine through because of their efforts. Okay, great. And I've got a shiny head just so, so it can shine through. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I didn't want to invite you back and uh, get your thoughts on the board and staff and the work that they've done this year. 
Sewell could not have navigated the pandemic without the leadership and guidance of Steve Holloway and Sewell's board of directors. We needed their financial operational expertise and their emotional support as we kept going through this. So huge kudos to the board and I wish you could see them all in your audience and know each of the board members. We also welcomed three new board members during this time period. Um, and so we're thrilled to have them as part of our board and to help build some of our energy. We kept our uh, comprehensive campaign efforts going through the We Are All Better Together campaign, and we want to thank Buzz Coble for his involvement and leadership in that as well. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, Heidi. And the staff. Got to talk about the staff. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> so the Sewell staff has been a resilient group who has come together from remote learning to coming back and put, making themselves vulnerable. And several of them, I know, are out there, though I can't see them. But one of our... Uh, toddler staff named Tanya likened getting through the pandemic through the early childhood book, we're, getting, we're going on a bear hunt. So her inspiration to us is you can't go over it, you can't go under it, you have to go through it. So a huge thank you uh, to the Sewell staff for going through this with us as we continue to navigate this. Then another one of our staff, Mary Sue, shared that she had watched the movie Apollo 13 recently. And as many of you know, it's the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 13 mission this year. For those of you who might remember, the mission team had to make a sudden change when an explosion in one of the oxygen tanks crippled the spacecraft during flight and the crew were forced to orbit the moon and return to the earth without landing. At that time, the NASA director said, this could be the worst disaster NASA's ever experienced. Gene Krantz replied, with all due respect, sir, I believe this is gonna be our finest hour. So we are hoping with the support of all of you and the skills and resourcefulness we've learned that maybe this will be our finest hour. Thanks. That's wonderful. Yeah, and I, I love the bear story, but you can't go under it, can't go around it, can't go over it. It reminds me of every defensive lineman I ever encountered in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so we we are, are about to watch a video on your partners and leadership program. Can you give us some insight into what that is? Sure. Sewell was a recipient of a grant from the Colorado Developmental Disability Council about four years ago to implement a parent advocacy and leadership program based on a curriculum entitled Partners in Policymaking. With the support of a great team led by Janine Westland, we've trained over 50 parents and self-advocates in the lifetime skills to become a strong advocate for their children. This is one of the programs we've been able to only strengthen during the pandemic, and we hope you enjoy hearing about it. Okay, great. Heidi, thank you very much. Steve, thank you. Uh, now we're going to show you that video about Sewell Child Development Center. My name is Tyler Gomez, and uh, I'm a partner in advocacy, and I have a son with special needs. So we were completely open to taking the class and I was super enthusiastic that I'd gotten the opportunity to sit next to the uh, basically Janine who's the facilitator of the class at that dinner. It just seemed like things, you know, happened for a reason. Before starting the class, I didn't realize we had to do a project, but that was a requirement of the class. And at this point, my son was going to an elementary school that had a playground that was just not functional for him. I mean, he'd come home after school, scrape knees, he had to be, his hand had to be held the entire time he was playing. My partner in the project, her name's Kira, um, she also wanted to do um, something focused on playgrounds and play equipment. Um, so yeah, we hooked up with the Jeffco uh, Parks Department um, in a pre-planning stage of their, on one of their biggest parks, it's called Clement Park. And so we actually sat down and we met with them and they were very open to the idea. They actually loved it of bringing in, you know, the special needs community. And, and we did get a lot of um, inclusive functionality change. So there was uh, like a double swing, um, an in-ground uh, merry-go-round. So the kids with wheelchairs could just roll onto the merry-go-round. They could actually participate. And so now that playground, I can literally just let my son go. and he can, It's safe. Um, he loves it. 
I think one of the biggest impacts from that project that I learned is there's a huge difference between accessibility and inclusivity. So basically when we first went to the park uh, designers, they had basically said, well, here's what we're doing for, in, you know, to make sure the park's inclusive. You know, we have wheelchair ramps. We have, you know, we do have a handicapped bathroom. And it kind of clicked in my head like, oh, they're making it accessible, which is like a legal thing that they have to do, but they're not making it inclusive. So, you know, yeah, you have a wheelchair ramp, but all the swings are for normal kids. So they actually, you know, can we put in one handicap swing? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, there was a clear line between accessibility and inclusivity that I, we didn't see before. And we actually, that's, that would say the biggest takeaway and lesson from doing the park project was that in, the difference between the two. Yeah, I would say the biggest thing would be around schooling. So we had had a couple meetings already with my son pre, pre me finishing partners. And it just felt like we were getting told. We'd go to the meetings and they would tell us what we can't, you know, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this many hours, blah, blah, blah. After partners, I mean, I, I remember this very clearly. We had a meeting with the principal. The principal wanted to be in the meeting. And I walked in with all the books that I got from partners so that they knew I was serious. You know, in partners, we learned some of these, these languages and these words that these teachers and facilitators, administrators use. And they're kind of like code words. Like a lot of them are acronyms and they would just throw it across the table to the other teachers, assuming that we didn't understand what it meant. So the acronym they threw across the table was LRE. And they had assumed that my wife and I didn't know what that meant. And it stands for least restrictive environment. So basically it's, it's a kid specific concept of what environment is least restrictive for them, where they're gonna learn the best. And I said, oh, you mean least restrictive environment? And you could see everyone at the table kind of tensed up and they were like, ooh, okay. He knows what he's talking about. And that just changed the entire conversation. The principals got a little nervous because we we're starting to ask for more resources. And so it just, it leveled the playing field. And that's, I think the biggest thing that Partners does is it levels that playing field. It gives you the resources for you to go in and say, no, I want this. Because they're not gonna give it to you. You definitely have to ask for it. Wow, that is, is amazing. And Tyler is with us here tonight. Tyler, please come on out. He's a board member, Tyler Gomez. That was wonderful. Thank you, thank you. Um, first of all, I wanna thank you all for being here and uh, taking the time to support Sewell. Um, crazy times we live in. Um, and I know uh, your support is definitely important every year, but it's critical this year. Um, every community is hurting, I know that but the special needs community is in dire needs of services that uh, Sewell does provide and is able to provide. And those donations will allow Sewell to do that. Um, so, you know, with your donations, you are ensuring that Sewell will be able to offer those services uh, to these amazing children and families. And we appreciate any and all contributions. And I seriously, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Hey, that's wonderful, Tyler. And before you go, I, I, I learned a couple of things watching that video. I thought that the distinction between accessibility and inclusivity is brilliant. I, I've never thought of it that way. Yeah, and honestly, that was the biggest thing I learned during that project is that there is a huge difference. I mean, uh, so le it's a legal difference. And uh, honestly, you know, yeah, you can build in, you know, an accessible playground, but uh, an inclusive environment is what we're really driving for. Yeah. Well, I can tell you what, my son's 17 now, but back when he was a little younger, he would have looked at both of those playgrounds that you showed in your video and been like, what? Especially that one like jungle gym. Amazing. It's, it was amazing. Yeah. The trombone, the trombone is the big feature at the Clement Park. Nice. Well, Tyler, hey, thank you for all that you do and thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, well, we've reached the time in our program where we can all get involved and make a difference for Sewell Child Development and the children and families that they support. We're gonna do a paddle raiser, but it's gonna be different from paddle raisers that you've experienced in the past. 
Um, I want to remind you, if you have not yet registered, please get yourself registered. It's easy to do. You can text Sewell to 50155. If you have already texted that, just look in your, in your text messages on your phone for a message from the number 50155. Click that link and you can get yourself uh, signed up to support. Now, um, some important information. Sewell Child Development qualifies for the Colorado Child Care Tax uh, Credit. And this is a big deal. And I am a former football player. There are some limitations that come with that. They've given me some verbiage to read here to explain what the, the child care tax credit is and what it does. But I cannot be trusted with this kind of information. Therefore, we're going to have Peter Tedstrom explain the child care tax credit. Hello, my name is Peter Tedstrom, and I have been a supporter of Sewell Child Development Center for quite a while. I have been a board member, I'm on the campaign committee, and I'm also a financial advisor. I wanted to let you know about a terrific way to give a lot of money to Sewell. Uh, last year, we had a pretty good year, and I wanted to make some a large donation to Sewell. And when I recognized or realized that the child care tax credit was available, I was very excited. And the way the child care tax credit works is, let's say you give $10,000, you can get a credit of up to 50% of your contribution. So in this case, if one gives $10,000, you can get a $5,000 tax savings. And then on top of that, you get a deduction for the contribution. So if your tax bracket is, let's say, 35% state and federal, you get another $3,500 of tax savings. So you take the tax credit of $5,000 and the tax deduction that allows you a $3,500 tax savings to give you a total of $8,500 of tax savings, which means essentially that you can give to Sewell $10,000, saving $8,500 in taxes, and therefore your net cost is $1,500. Thank you and have a great day. Bye-bye. Oh, my bald brother, thank you so much for that explanation. And that is perfect. Ladies and gentlemen, what he basically said is you could give a lot of money to Sewell is not going to cost you that much out of your pocket. And so whatever you are thinking about giving, I want you to think maybe a little bigger and make a bigger gift. All right. So we're going to ask for support at different levels and um, we're going to start high and work our way down. And we hope that you'll make at least one gift tonight when you hear a level that matches your means and matches your commitment to Sewell Child Development and the families and children that they support. And I'm going to ask Heidi to come out and join me for uh, this conversation to help put some context around this. We're going to start at $5,000. And if you'd like to donate $5,000, please do so now on your cell phone. And I know $5,000 is a lot of money, but it's also a lot of impact. Heidi, can you uh, frame what $5,000 would mean for Sewell? Sure. $5,000 allows one teaching team with the transdisciplinary members I mentioned to participate in a college class and get training, um, which is critical to their ongoing uh, education they provide to young children. And that would let them do that for a three-month training series. Okay, and that's wonderful. And, and what I've learned over the years of working with Sewell is that you guys don't just train um, the teachers who work in your own school, you're training teachers all over the place. So this knowledge about how to uh, best serve this population of kids is spread all over the country. Right, exactly like what you heard Tyler talking about, just te uh, training teachers and families all together. That's wonderful. Okay. All right. We're going to step down one level to $2,500. We'd like to, if you'd like to make a donation of $2,500, please do that now on your phone. Um, if you have not yet registered, you can text the word Sewell to the number 50155 and get yourself signed up. Please make your contribution. What would $2,500 mean for Sewell, Heidi? $2,500 helps us develop a whole um, remote based learning. Uh, curriculum for a month for a classroom of children and for that team to work together to to develop that to make sure that parents have the technology and the staff have the technology to be able to do that. Talk about topical. I mean, that is 
what has to happen now with all of these uh, kids and remote learning. And we have at $2,500 here, I see Wendy Fish. Wendy, thank you so much for your gift of $2,500. We appreciate you. Anyone else wanna join in at $2,500, please make a contribution now. Um, Heidi, we're gonna step down one more level to $1,000. And what would $1,000 mean for Sewell? Well, what we've seen in this pandemic is we have a lot of not only families who don't have didn't have laptops to join us, but we also had staff who didn't have laptops and the appropriate software. So this gives us the laptops and the technology availability so people can be in their homes and providing those resources to children. Okay, that's wonderful. And, and I know that uh, this year has just created a special level of need uh, because there's all these additional hurdles that you have to get over. There's all the normal stuff, but now um, like every, all, the, all families are dealing with teaching their kids at home, but for kids who have special needs, that challenge for those parents is even more acute. Exactly. It's, they're seeing that that is the biggest impact during this pandemic. Um, is the what the families are having to navigate in their homes to provide the appropriate education. That's great. Okay. We have at $1,000, we have Ann Wilson and Kevin Conroy. Thank you both very much for your gifts of $1,000. Anyone else want to make a contribution, please uh, do so now. We're going to keep working our way down and we're going to $500 now. And as we, we have three levels left, $500, $250, and $100. And we hope that each of you will make a gift tonight to Sewell Child Development. And we're, we're getting to the level now where more and more of us can afford to participate. You might not have $5,000, you might not have $2,500, but most of us could find a way to uh, support a worthy cause at, at the $500, $250, or $100 level. And so we're gonna ask you to do that now. And, and what would $500 mean for Sewell, Heidi? So with this focus on our pandemic, we look at $500 helps provide a family of four with food for a month. And some for some of our families, that's what they needed support um, in the spring. And we anticipate that's what they're gonna need support with as we go into this next quarter so that they have the means to um, keep their children at home and with the employment situation and give them all the right nutrition. Yeah, that's, I've been seeing on reading reports about just how many people are in line at food banks. And, you know, we are, we already know that with, with education, being, having, having a steady diet is a big part of being able to be educated and kids show up at school without, uh, with empty stomachs, they can't learn anything. And so that's important support. And we have a couple more gifts here. We have Nicholas Raffensperger. Um, who's donated $1,000. Thank you very much, Nicholas. We have Randall Sylvan at $1,000. We have Kim and Jim P Possell, who joined in at $10,000. We appreciate your generous support. Uh, we have Peter Weinberg at $500. Susan Sharkey at $500. Thank you so much for your gifts. And we have Carly Steck at $2,500. Thank you all for your generous support. Please keep those gifts uh, coming. And would you say, um, Heidi, that this year you guys have had to reinvent the way that you support some of the families that you support? Absolutely. We, are, we don't usually provide food and we have not usually pro provided rent assistance, but that has been necessary. So families haven't had to go all over um, the city to be able to access supports for their young children, in particular, their young children with special needs. Right. Okay. All right, well, let's keep this going. Let's go down to $250. Uh, what would that mean for Sewell? One of the things we had to invest in when we reopened in June was the safety and protective gear. So we, um, we use touchless thermometers for everybody to get their temperature taken every morning. We have safety, cleaning, and protective gear, extra investment in custodial services. Um, creative face masks that some of you will see in the bidding and the silent auctions. This, uh, some of the older kids made some uh, tie-dye masks and they're for sale in the silent auction. So, um, but we have really had to invest heavily in all of the protective gear to keep everybody safe. Yeah, that's, that's important. And, and I see we've got people who are making investments in you. We have Bill Holland at $1,000. Thank you, Bill. We have Lauren Womble at $1,000. Thank you, Lauren. And at 250, Heidi Anderson, thank you very much. We appreciate you. Catherine Adams at $500, thank you very much. Please keep those donations coming. We're just under $25,000 raised so far. So please keep those donations coming. 
And our final level tonight is $100. And what would a $100 gift mean, Heidi? $100 helps us keep the toys refreshed in all of the classrooms and um, books and all of the interactive equipment that we need for when children are coming back across all of our sites and across all the services we provide out in the community. That's great. Okay. Well, at $100, we have Lori Helmstetter, Lena Peschenkaya, and Helen Richards. Thank you all for your for your gifts. Please, uh, we're right at about $25,000 right now, and we we still need your support. We're going to move on with our program, but please keep those donations coming and um, keep supporting Sewell Child Development. Heidi, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for your support. You bet. Okay, well, we are going to continue now, and I'm excited to introduce our next guest. She is our keynote speaker for tonight. It is Dr. Temple Grandin. Um, she is a phenomenal person. She is a teacher, um, of our professor of animal sciences up at CSU. She is a world-renowned person and advocate for human or the humane treatment of animals, and she speaks often on the subject of autism, and we are blessed to have her join us tonight. Dr. Temple Grandin, please join us on our virtual stage here. So great to have you tonight. It's really great to be here tonight. And uh, when I was a little kid, I was severely autistic. I had no speech till age four. And now I'm a professor of animal science at Colorado State University. I've been there for 30 years. I do a animal behavior work. I did some of the very first work on on cattle temperament and the weight gain, calm cows gain more weight. <laughs> that was a project I did a long time ago. I worked with uh, zoo animals on training them to uh, voluntarily cooperate with veterinary procedures. Uh, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of early intervention. I got into very good speech therapy school by the time I was two and a half. Uh, I, uh, my speech teacher would speak slowly to me because when the grown-ups talk really fast, it went into gibberish, like blah, 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 blah. So you've got to slow down when you talk to these kids. My speech teacher would enunciate a word like cup, and then she'd say cup, and she'd go back and forth between saying cup and cup. Another thing you got to teach the little ones is turn-taking, how to wait and take turns at a game, because that controls uh, impulse. Another thing that was helpful to me was old-fashioned 50s uh, upbringing, where uh, Everybody has to sit at the table and tell about their day and take turns talking. And I get asked all the time, well, how about COVID? How have I handled that? One of the things that's really helped me is I got to get up in the morning, get dressed and be ready for work by seven. And you know what? I feel a whole lot better. If I just slouch around, I don't feel very good. So just for fun, I thought I'd look up life on the International Space Station. They do the same thing. They get them up. No, you don't slouch around in your underpants and you have a schedule and you've got to work, exercise. You also have a midday meal where you sit down and eat while well, you float around and you eat with everybody. And you also have time off. And NASA and a Russian space agency have both learned that this was essential so that people could get along. I mean, Scott Kelly spent a year on a space station. He said he just, you know, it was really important that he had a schedule. And um, I also try to get out every day and do a walk and do my exercises. That really helps. Now, one of the problems you got with autism is when the kids are really little, like when I was three, I looked really bad. And then you can't tell if you work with the kid really hard, which one's gonna become verbal, which one doesn't. But all the research shows that the earlier you get working on these kids, the better. I was in therapy by two and a half. I was just talking to a lady in another state she does therapy and sometimes waiting months to get a diagnosis. If you wait months to get a diagnosis, you're wasting precious time when you need to be working with the kid because the younger the kid, the better it is when you start working on them. Another little tip when you're working with these little kids is give them time to respond. They're like a phone with lousy service and you've got to wait for them to respond. Now the HBO movie shows really nicely how I think in pictures. And take the thing a kid's good at and develop it. Some are visual thinkers like me, thinking pictures. Some are math thinkers. Well, then maybe you need to introduce computer programming to them. You know, it's uneven skills. Build on the thing they're good at. Others are word thinkers. And even individuals that remain nonverbal, some of them can type independently. And uh, no, I just can't emphasize enough. 
the importance of, uh, of taking the strength. My mother always encouraged my ability in art. And here's some tip puffs on sensory stuff. Sensory problems really are real. And uh, so I had sound sensitivity. Another kid may have visual sensitivity. Now, sometimes you can get a child to tolerate a sound if they control it. So if they don't like the hairdryer, let them turn it on and off. They may get to where they can um, tolerate it. Now, one of the biggest problems I'm seeing is transition to adulthood. I'm seeing too many smart kids doing good grades in high school, even going to college, but then they don't handle the workplace well. And that's because they haven't been taught working skills. These kids need to learn how to do tasks outside the family where somebody else is the boss. Because I have all kinds of granddads coming up to me. And when I did a talk in Houston, I had granddads coming up to me that were NASA space scientists. And they found out that they were on the autism spectrum when the kids got diagnosed. But granddaddy had a paper route. So he learned how to work. I'm seeing too many teenagers. Uh, they aren't learning skills in shopping, bank account. They're not learning basic life skills that I was doing when I was a little kid. Um, so I want to just see these kids get out there and be really successful and understand now it's time for questions. And that's the part I like the best is the questions. I said, uh, yes, ma'am. And well, so I uh, guess yes, Reggie's going to ask me some questions. Yes, ma'am. Well, uh, and first I want to tell everybody, if you have any questions for Dr. Grandin, please put them in the comments on Facebook and they'll get related to me and I will ask them to her. Uh, one that we have is, what do you think is the biggest misconception about children with autism? Well, the problem is autism's turned into a big spectrum. You know, one of the problems is it's not a precise diagnosis. Okay, COVID, if you get the right tests, some of the tests aren't very accurate, but you actually get a decent test. They can tell you, is the COVID virus there or not? That's something that's a definitive diagnosis. But you see, autism is kind of a behavioral profile and it's so variable. But the problem is when the kids are very little, uh, you can't tell which one might become verbal and which one won't. You can't tell when they're very little. Um, you know, when they get to be six or seven, um, that's why it's so important to do the early intervention but it's such a big spectrum. And on one thing I don't like to see is a fully verbal smart sixth grader, for example, put in a class with kids that have much more severe challenges because they need really different kinds of services. People get too locked into the labels. You know, I was just talking to this lady down uh, in another state and they're waiting six, seven, eight months to get a diagnosis. We are wasting valuable time when you need to be working with that kid. The, bread, the research is very clear. The younger you can work with them, the better. That's great. We have a question from Elizabeth who says, what has kept you going over the years? Well, there's a lot of things that have kept me going. It makes me really happy when somebody says, well, my kid went to college because of one of my books. Of course, now I gotta show off one of my books, The Way I See It. And The Way I See It's my most basic book on autism, a lot of little short chapters. Um, I have graduate students in animal science. The other thing is, for me, my primary identity is a scientist. And this brings up mentors that helped me in high school. I was a rotten student. I got bullied in high school and I didn't care about studying. So my school put me in charge of the horse farm. I learned how to work, clean nine stalls every day. But I still wasn't doing any studying until Mr. Carlock, my science teacher, came around. And what he did is he, he changed studying from being something to do to make the family happy to a pathway to a goal. And when studying became a pathway to a goal, I knuckled down and I started to study. That's so great. I can't emphasize enough mentors. My mother had really good instincts on just how hard to push me. You gotta stretch these kids, stretch them and give them choices. That's great. Uh, Luz um, wants to know, what kind of job do you suggest for a 16 year old boy? Well, I got to know something about his skills. One thing that's going to be a problem is multitasking is a problem. I can think of some jobs that will not work. Super busy McDonald's takeout window. Um, you know, we have a store in Fort Collins and their Christmas wrapping stations like crazy. Uh, a lot of multitasking is bad. Um, now, the kind of work I did on uh, designing work, I could, the way I did interviews is I just showed off my drawings. I would simply just show people my drawings. I'd sell my work. I, and rather than trying to sell myself, I would just show the work. In fact, I'll show you some of my drawings. I would just put them out on the table. Um, 
put them out on the table and show them to people. There's some of my drawings right there. Oh. And oh, I right. would just show the work off. You might have another kid, some mathematical kid. Now, the thing that's a problem is people don't uh, differentiate between a person where bagging groceries is a suitable career and where it's a training job. For me, it would have been a training job. Well, let's just start out, you know, simple jobs, but I'd like to start out with volunteer jobs when they're around 11. Now, the problem we've got today is all the churches and community centers, all those places are closed now. But those were perfect places for kids to do volunteer jobs on a schedule outside the home. Uh, but they've got to learn how to work. Don't wait until they're out of school before you start jobs. And then just use your connections to get them into a job. Half of all good jobs for everybody are backdoor through connections Right. For everybody. You know, uh, we have another question here. What do you tell a parent who is freaked out by the diagnosis for their kid? Well, I'm gonna assume we're talking about a parent of a real little kid. Well, you, they, you got to start working on the therapy and, and you, and some kids, you kind of get them verbal and you might get someone like me. You just don't know when they're real little. Uh, but the thing is you can't wait. Now, one thing that the doctor did with me, it was actually a neurologist, not a psych, not a psychiatrist, checked me for epilepsy. And if the child does not have epilepsy, that's usually a good sign, but you got to start working with them. And, and that's what you got to do. And then you get the kid that gets diagnosed maybe by age 10. He had no speech delay, a little more Asperger type of kid. And he's getting bullied in school. I've been out to Silicon Valley. We wouldn't have this tech that we're on right now without people with autism. A little bit of autism gives you all this tech we're using. Right. <laughs> that's great. Another question is, what do you recommend to say to families so that they stay motivated and keep working at it? Well, I... You know, it can be, you see, you see, these are real general questions. I kind of want to know, are we talking about a family, a newly diagnosed three-year-old or two-year-old, or talking about a teenager? I just got an email the other day of a nonverbal teenager of breaking every kitchen cabinet in their house. Uh, you know, that is the sort of kind of thing that's very difficult to deal with. That was an email I just got the other day. And I wrote to him and I said, call me. Um, let what what did you learn uh christina wants to know what did you learn from about farm animals that applied to humans well farm animals get scared really easily and one of the my main emotion is fear now that's been controlled now for 40 years with antidepressant drugs and in my book thinking in pictures i explain my my uh, experience with medication it saved me now there's too many drugs given out to little kids way too casually it's just disgusting um and, but I was one of the ones as a young adult in my thirties, early thirties, if I hadn't gone on the antidepressants, I had, my nervous system was ramped up so much fear. My fear center was three times larger than normal and the medication ramped that down. I, I don't think I'd be here now without that. And the reason why I was eating yogurt and jello in the movie was because I had colitis, everything went through me. And when I went on the disipramine, it's an old fashioned tricyclic antidepressant before Prozac came on the market. Um, it was like magic for me. And that's why I have to drink a lot of water. Gotcha. Okay. And you mentioned um, earlier that some grandfathers come up to you and they discover that they're autistic because their, their grandchild was. That's right. And so it's then, happened often, often. So Andrea was asking, um, how much more common do you think the diagnosis is uh, because of awareness uh, com compared to 10 or 20 years ago? Well, when I worked in construction, I spent uh, 25 years out on construction sites uh, supervising um, jobs that I had designed, major big companies. And I'm going to estimate that 20% of the super skilled welders, where I could just give them a drawing, they could build anything, super smart people with machine redesign, people laying out whole entire factories, they were either autistic, ADHD, or dyslexic. And I am saying that absolutely seriously. And one of the worst things the schools have done is taking out the hands-on classes and they'll go, oh, well, little Johnny's autistic, so he can't take welding. Well, I've worked with a lot of welders that were definitely autistic. I know a guy who stutters, ADHD, autistic, horrible student, took welding, owns a big metal fabrication company, 
owns it. And he started out small and he's selling stuff all over the world. And I've been out to Silicon Valley and gone into rooms full of programmers and it's absolutely silent. Everybody's got the headphones on working on their computers. <laughs> wow. So this, is, is this is the problem. You see, autism is a true continuous trait. One that's being a little bit geeky become autistic. And I, granddaddy had, was brought up 50s where you were taught social skills. Like in my neighborhood, when kids got to be seven or eight and the families had a party, you had to put your good clothes on and be little party hosts and hostesses. Well, that taught social skills. And all the kids in my neighborhood did that. Right. Um, question here, and, and I would assume that this question is probably for a kid who's a little bit older. How do you talk to your child about their own diagnosis to acknowledge that, yes, there is something different and here's what it's called and, and here's how it manifests itself? Well, I'll tell them Einstein had no speech till age three. Now, people will argue as to whether or not he's autistic, but he definitely would have been in special ed with no speech delay and maybe not very good speech until age four. He'd be in special ed. I, there's just no question about that. You see, that's the problem. And, and I, one of the problems we got today is you got all the video game addictions. Too many kids are getting addicted to video games. I, you know, when I was a child, we were out, you know, playing out in the fields and building forts and flying kites and, and social skills were taught in a much more structured manner in the fifties. That's another reason why granddaddy got the job. And I've talked to uh, grandfathers in Houston, several of them. And I've talked to them. I was at a big tech uh, conference one time and I had a computer programmer come up to me crying and he's saying, I'm one of those dads. <laughs> you know, this is something that's happening over and over. And I'm seeing some problems with parents kind of overprotecting kids and they're not learning basic skills like shopping, bank account. I was shopping when I was seven and eight. I got 50 cents a week for allowance. I could buy five comics with it. But if I wanted that 69 cent airplane, I had to save for two weeks. <laughs> it's now a $5 airplane. But mother didn't buy those little balsa wood airplanes. I had to, you know, that came out of allowance. Well, that taught important skills. That's not hard to do. But I'm seeing 16 year olds doing really well in school who have never gone shopping. And then when I suggested their kid go buy something, the mom broke down and said she couldn't let go. And I've gotten kids, um, I, was, I had a lady come up to me at the airport one time. Yeah, airport, I don't know what that is. I haven't been there since March. Um, and she had a daughter who's probably, you know, 12, 13 years old. And she, I found out she never shopped. So I pulled a $5 bill out of my bag and I said, go buy something in that newsstand. And she went over and bought a drink and came back and gave me the change. First time she'd shopped. Wow. That's ridiculous. Wow. So it sounds like that your parents didn't shy away. They didn't, they didn't uh, treat you differently. They didn't do anything differently. And, and is that what built your self-confidence and your self-esteem? Well, yeah, and they, now my mother realized that certain noisy things were a problem and I was able to you know, get away from that. But there were some expectations. And what happened in the 50s is the kids that were fully verbal, or let's say Asperger types, they ended up getting jobs. And, and the problem we got today is a lot of kids aren't getting exposed to enough stuff to figure out what they might want to do for work. How did I get involved with cattle? I was exposed to beef cattle when I was 15 at my aunt's ranch. I was at Eastern originally and I was scared to go out to my aunt's ranch. Mother gave me a choice, go for a week or go all summer. Not going was an option. Give some choices. There's been some good successes with getting kids off of video games, you know, like young adults with auto mechanics. And you slowly do more and more auto mechanics and less and less video games. There's been three successes with that. Gotcha. Uh, good question here. They have a 10 year old son, very verbal, but he, he struggles with making friendships. It's hard to make and keep friends. Have you any advice for them about how to interact with others? Well, through shared interests. Only place where I had friends was shared interests. And I was bullied in high school and I had friends riding horses. I had friends with uh, model rockets and electronics. For another kid, it might be band or music or computer programming or robotics club, friends through shared interests. And then I had to learn that you can't tell the same joke 50 times. They don't wanna hear that. You know, I had to just learn that. 
When I was in college, I had a rule, no more than two questions per class. You can't carry on a dialogue with the teacher in class. But friends who shared interests is one of the best, best ways. The other thing that helped me on bullying in elementary school is my teacher did a thing called peer mediated intervention. Now she didn't know what that was. Peer mediated intervention. She just um, had uh, told the other students that I had a disability that wasn't visible like a wheelchair and they needed to be helping me. I didn't get that in high school. High school is the worst part of my life. Oh, wow. Okay, well, this is great. Um, uh, over the years, there've been many competing philosophies about the best strategies to teach children who are on the spectrum. Do you have a sense of what's currently being recommended? Well, there's been all kinds of, you're talking little kids again? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, well, there's been all the controversies about ABA and stuff like that. Uh, some of the old fashioned ABA was bad. They, they drove the kids into sensory overload. Um, what a lot of people don't realize about ABA, it was originally designed as a little kids program. And then once you get them talking, you just, you, know, you kind of, you know, back off of some of that stuff. Um, but the thing I have found is what's important is having a good teacher. You got to get enough hours of one-to-ones. Um, you know, and you have different names for different therapies. And one of the things I've noticed is the really good teachers do the same thing, regardless what the name of the therapy is. So I always ask, well, how many hours of one-to-ones are you getting? And then I want to look at progress, speech, turn-taking, basic skills, dressing, eating with utensils, showering, using the bathroom, you know, your tooth brushing, just basic skills. And and if they're getting good progress, then you're doing something right. You know, there's, there's uh, I'm seeing too many people totally hung up on, you look at what the teacher does. Some teachers have the knack because if you push too hard in some of these kids, you're gonna drive them into sensory overload and that's a real mess. And that's very painful for the person. But a good teacher knows this one, I can push a little harder than that one and I'm, um, and the turn taking, because that get that control helps with impulse control. But the good programs, regardless of what they're called, you know, they do some you know behavior type of stuff, but they also do sensory integration stuff. And sensory integration is evidence based. There's uh, papers out on that now. Uh, good teachers use you know a combination of approaches. And I want to see the kid make progress. Now I'll tell you something that's not okay. They get half an hour of OT and speech a week. That is not sufficient. I go into a lot of low income areas and I suggest to the mom, use that teacher for a coach, go to your church, whatever, get some volunteers, get some volunteers because you can't do it all yourself and use the, get guidance from that teacher once a week because you've got to put the one to ones in and these little ones. Right, Dr. Grandin, our last question tonight is from an 11 year old named Simon. And he wants to know, how did you learn to be such a good artist? Well, when I was in third grade, I, mother noticed I was good at art. I was always encouraged to do lots of different kinds of art. Another kid, it might be mathematics. Build on the math. He may have some trouble with reading, but accentuate the math. You know, and there's some nonverbal individuals that can type on a tablet. Some really good books for nonverbals is Tita Makapade. How can I talk if my lips don't move? And he describes a sensory disordered world, having problems with controlling his movements. How can I talk if my lips don't move? If you're working with kids older than five that are nonverbal, that book's a must read. And he types completely independently, no risk of support, completely independently. Nobody's touching the thing he types on. That's also important. Another book is um, the sequel to The Reason I Jump. That's the book by the little Japanese boy. There's a sequel and that's a better book because he's older and he talks about problems with um, uh, be able, not being able to control movements, but you're going to really get insight into the mind of a, uh, you know, a nonverbal, these are nonverbal people that type independently. Carly's Voice is another good book. These are three people that type completely independently. And if you're working with that, I'm not talking about the three-year-olds here. You know, they're a little bit older, but not talking of their adults, these books are must reads. Right. And I don't get any commissions from these books, <laughs> but I think I, I learned a lot reading them. That's you know, wonderful. think sensory problems way worse. And they often smell and touch things. 
because those senses still work. And seeing's all pixelated and horrible, like a bad internet connection or a bad satellite TV. Right. Dr. Temple Grandin, thank you so much. We appreciate you. Thank you for making time tonight for Sewell Talk. It was Talk. really good to be here. And I'm going to sign off. And uh, thank you very, very much for having me. Thank you. All right. That was a wonderful conversation. It's informative and interesting. And uh, she is an interesting person. I, I just was listening and thinking, you know what? Uh, tonight, I got to get that movie on, on Netflix and watch it again. I, I watched it years ago, but now I have to watch it again with a fresh set of eyes. All right, so please keep your donations coming. We're at $32,000 raised so far. I want to say thank you to Brian Sullivan at $250, Jody Mack at $250, Sharon Ernest at $250, Barb uh, Bieber, the Beeb at $500, Catherine Adams at $500, Peter Weinberg at $500, uh, Bill Holland at $1,000. I can't remember if I said your name already. Lauren Womble at $1,000. And then we have a, a bunch at $100, Alice Gretzel, Harwood, Mary Sue Johnson, Evelyn Sickle, Sharon Jacksey, Amy Merch, Christina House, Lori Helmstetter, um, and then a couple that I've named already. So thank you so much. We appreciate your generous support of Sewell Child Development. And I'd like to invite Heidi uh, to come back. And Heidi, uh, what do you think about all this? What a, what a great event this has been. I think this is fabulous. It's so great to have all of this support and uh, joining us virtually. I miss that I can't see you all, but I'm enjoying all of this support. And uh, thank you. It was great to hear Dr. Grand and the real life issues that so many people face and uh, strength and ability focus. Wonderful. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, thank you. And and thank you again, uh, Dr. Grant. And I appreciate your being here. I appreciate listening to you. I feel like I learned a lot and, and gained a lot. And uh, Heidi, I think that's you hit the nail on the head, ability focus, that um, thinking of just walking through Silicon Valley and saying, yeah, these people have Asperger's. They, they wouldn't be doing this if they didn't have this and really seeing the potential of their ability. That's wonderful. Exactly right. Okay, so we want to thank the Beacon Celebration uh, Committee of Casey Adams, Kevin Conroy, and Lynn Stambaugh. And this evening wouldn't have been possible without their support. So thank you, all of you. I want to thank all of you who joined us tonight for the virtual Beacon Celebration. On behalf of Sewell and all the children and all the families they serve, I want to say thank you for being here. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your support. Have a great evening, everybody.